History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 7. Spirit in the Course of the World, December 1st, 1964. Last time during my discussion of the dialectics of the universal and the particular, I took the opportunity to say a few words about the concept of conformism, more especially about the currently fashionable ways of dealing with it. In the light of our basic theme, the antithesis of society and the individual, the universal and the particular, it will have become clear to you just how difficult it is to pin down the idea of conformism to fixed categories. If you analyze the conformist elements in Hegel, there is no great problem involved in this. If you read the philosophy of right and take note of the conformist elements in it, you will soon see that his sympathies always lean towards the universal and that the individual is fobbed off with the assurance that the universal, the absolute, the idea, maintains itself by destroying him. An assertion that does nothing to restore his peace of mind. It reminds him of the consolation offered by the church to a man contemplating his own death. But thanks to secularization, is incomparably feebler and less persuasive than the promises given by the church in times gone uh, times gone by, when a dying man could be promised eternal salvation. Whereas now the idea of eternal salvation is no more than a shape of consciousness. This shape of consciousness is of course essential and does provide the individual with a salvation of sorts. But you learn nothing of its substantive meaning from Hegel. While the individual is in fact supposed to be pleased if he or she dissolves into nothing ad majorum de glorium, Incidentally, categories generally become diluted to the point of absurdity in the course of secularization, and this strengthens the tendency to rebel against the entire process. On the other hand, it is true in our day, as also in the 1920s, that conformism has insisted on the importance of the individual, a concept that had been inflate, inflated during the 19th century at the expense of all others. Now, in a now, in a situation such as existed then, in which socialism appeared to be an imminent possibility, and in which the tendency of the communist state in Russia to repress the individual had just begun to make itself felt, the concept of the individual began to play a significant role as a reaction to socialism. In other words, in defense of existing society. This was the idea of the precious, immortal individual which was now in jeopardy but which had played a similar role at other times, namely during periods of the untrammeled, unrestrained ascendancy of the individual, such as the Romantic Age in which Hegel had lived. In such times, too, the individual had assumed a conformist function. What I wanted to show you, and the real reason why I have introduced the concept of conformism, is not only to immunize you against a kind of formalistic thinking that asserts that, all right then, there is a conformism from a spirit of opposition as well as a conformism of the conformists, is all as broad as it's long. That is an indescribably superficial way of thinking, and my hope is that I will have, to have put you off it forever. But even more importantly, I should like to show you that categories may be subject to radically different interpretations within the dialectics of the universal in particular. This means that it is not possible to tell in advance what is conformist or nonconformist, that these concepts always call for analysis, and in fact, they presuppose the nuanced analysis of particular historical situations. On the specific point of the celebrated and also much denounced conformism of the opposition, it is perfectly possible, particularly when discussing intellectual, artistic products with an oppositional slant, to make quite precise distinctions and not blindly accept statements at face value in the spirit of a ticket mentality. If one can muster the energy and patience needed to make the necessary distinctions oneself without capitulating and making concessions to the dominant healthy attitudes, then one can quite easily evade the allegedly so dangerous conformism of the opposition. I myself fondly imagine that I have been able to provide a small model of how this is to be achieved in my essay, The Aging of the New Music. I have tried to show there how a process of self-reflection can make it possible to resist 
the formation of cliches from within an oppositional intellectual movement. My hope is that this attempt will not have been entirely without its effect. I should like to make one last point about conformism. It too is one of the concepts that are falsified as soon as they are released from their context, or taken abstractly, as Hegel and Marx would have said. Such concepts only acquire the substantial meaning within the social matrix in which they appear. I should even like to venture this still broader generalization, one of some importance for a theory of history, insofar as it is at all possible to establish general principles in a dialectical philosophy, that there is no category, no valid concept that might not be rendered invalid at the moment when it is cut off from the concrete context to which it really belongs. This applies with particular force to the concept of ratio, which is of such pivotal importance for the theory of history, and I believe that it will do us no harm to cudgel our brains a little on this subject before we proceed further. I have already told you that the simplest way to construct something like a universal history is to create the history of a progressive rationality. Now it is extremely easy to hold this ratio, in other words, the unfolding of reason, responsible for the perennial ca catastrophes of history. We can indeed say with only minor exaggeration that all, and I mean, and I mean all, the so-called romantic intellectual tendencies do just that. But my own view is that it is also important not to hypostasize reason and its history, something that Max Weber tended to do. That is to say, it is important not to split reason off from the things reason is useful for, that it is there for and in which it is embedded. I explained to you in one of the recent lectures that the element of domination and thus the conflict inherent in reason was itself intrinsic to the process of history, that the concept of reason necessarily contains matter alien to reason, matter that has to be subjugated. I argue that the concept of reason only has meaning if there exists outside it material on which it can act by abstracting, arranging, or summarizing, etc. My intention, and I think it is important to clarify this, was not to talk you into a kind of idealist philosophizing. I did not mean the reason in which all this is embedded to be thought of as the origin, the absolute origin of the material it dominates, and on which it works. It would be quite contrary to what I have been trying to tell you if you were to go away believing that there is a dialectic of ratio, or, God forbid, enlightenment, in the sense of a dialectic of pure forms of consciousness, independently of the material to which it relates. What I would say, and I have hinted at this already, but I should like to repeat it quite explicitly, is that precisely the abstract nature of ratio, that is, its setting aside of concrete subject matter, points to social processes in which everything depends on who is equal with whom or rather unequal, in the social hierarchy. That is to say, abstract reason ignores these specific concrete aspects of society. Specific class relations, for example, cannot be explained by an appeal to ratio, although they reproduce themselves in it. Instead, reason contains this amalgam of abstract thought and material that has to be subjugated, and this fact is itself merely the reflection of an attitude of thought, of reason, to reality, which in its turn, and this too we must reiterate, does not remain external to reason. On the contrary, as Durkheim was the first to have pointed out, in an inspired but also highly contentious way, reason becomes embedded in the forms of consciousness including its most abstract forms, such as the categories of pure logic, and even the so-called intuitive forms of time and space. However, I leave open the question of whether there is not a dialectic at work here in the sense that, for hierarchical social conditions to be deposited in subjective forms, there must always be an element of constitutive subjectivity which ensures that people experience things in one way rather than another. That is a complex matter that I really wish to mention only in passing and certainly do not want to resolve here. Thus, we may speak of the irrationality of ratio in the present historical phase. We may point out that the prodigious achievements of science benefit only a small group of people, or that science seems to be moving towards the destruction of the human race. We may accuse reason of all sorts of other irrationalities. Indeed, I would not defend reason against these accusations. 
I would certainly not deny that as the process of rationalization advances. It claims any number of victims. But we should not let things get out of proportion. We must be clear in our own minds that the responsibility for the threats that the advancing sciences unleash on mankind lies not with reason or science, but with the way in which reason is entwined with very real social, or social conditions. Within these social conditions, reason is directed at purposes that are irrational because of the irrational state of society as a whole. Thus, while reason contains such a destructive element, thanks to its unreflecting persistence as stolid domination, the blame for this must not be laid exclusively at the door of the isolated category of ratio, but must be ascribed to the totality. It can really only be grasped in the relationship between the processes of rationalization, chief among them scientific and technical inventions, and the external purposes imposed on them and from which they cannot escape. For even though this advancing ratio impinges on and even modifies the existing relations of domination, it is always tied into them. Having said this, I should now like us to turn our attention to the problem of the subjective experience of the negativity of history. Since this will be one of the principal themes with which we shall be concerned, I should like to read out to you a few sentences from Hegel's philosophy of right that I would like to explain to you and that have some bearing on our discussions. They are to be found in the preface, that right and ethics and the actual world of right and the ethical are grasped by means of thoughts and give themselves the form of rationality, namely universality and determinacy by means of thoughts is what constitutes the law. And it is this which is justifiably regarded as the main enemy by that feeling which reserves the right to do as it pleases but that conscience which identifies right with subjective conviction. Oh, sorry. By that conscience which identifies right with subjective conviction. The form of right as a duty and a law is felt by it to be a dead cold letter and a shackle. For it does not recognize itself in the law and thereby recognize its own freedom in it. Because the law is the reason of the thing and reason does not allow feeling to warm itself in the glow of its own particularity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these statements carry conviction. They sound like statements that have something in them. And whenever people feel that they are hearing something that is backed up by the power of what exists, they generally re react in a highly suggestible manner. In this instance, however, these statements are those of a demagogue. I should like to demonstrate this to you and to draw your attention to a few details. To begin with then, to begin with then, Um, I lost my spot, sorry. I should like to demonstrate this to, to begin with then. It is claimed that conscience identifies right with subjective conviction. If Hegel has Kant in mind here, as we must assume, he ought to know, as someone steeped in the history of philosophy, and Kant especially, that Kantian ethics and the Kantian conscience not only makes no mention of the feeling that he is no that he is so scathing about here, but that Kant is just as hostile to this so-called ethical feeling as Hegel himself. In this respect, he differs from earlier moralists such as Hutcheson and Shaftesbury, for whom the idea of ethical feeling was seen in a far more positive light. This has a significance which goes well beyond questions of dogma. The fact is that what he criticizes here as subjective conviction constantly recurs in individuals. And this is why I wish to note it in Kant, and is perfectly rational in itself. Thus, however isolated, uh, thus, however isolated an individual may be, if he criticizes a historical trend which he feels powerless to change, this cannot simply be dismissed as the grumbling of the disaffected, or the irrational protest of someone who feels pangs of emotion. His protest, if it has any substance at all, will contain an element of reason. Thus, when individuals protested about the Third Reich, it was not just from a sense of moral outrage. If the protester was politically conscious, conscious, and I believe I may even claim this of myself and my initial, me initial memories of Hitlerism, then he must have been aware that the policies being introduced were catastrophic and that the National Socialists were launched on an adventurous path that could end only in disaster. That could only end in disaster. <clears throat> 
The crucial factor here is that the awareness that Hegel tacitly and dogmatically ascribes to a collective consciousness can also be, be present in, in, in an individual. By thinking the individual shares in the objective nature of thought or can do so. To put it in a Hegelian manner, he shares in the objectivity of spirit, unless the objectivity of his own thought is determined merely by impulses and is complete, completely unbalanced in consequence. Hegel simply ignores the element of objectivity, of universality, that lies concealed in the particular, in individuality, and that enables it to determine itself as thought, as a thinking monad. He thus fails to recognize an aspect of his own dialectic, of universal in particular, that he of all people should have emphasized more strongly. This is the idea that the figure of the universal in which the particular possesses the universal to a substantial degree is an actual fact, or is in actual fact the process of thought in which the particular is raised to the level of the universal. This thought is located nowhere but in the individual. Only individuals can think. Blind collectives quite certainly cannot, and the contrast has become even more pronounced nowadays when collective reactions are being so blatantly manipulated. You can see from this just how fuzzy Hegel's critique is. Linked with this is his avoidance of the main issue when at one point he denounces the sentiment of thinking oneself superior, where in reality, what is at stake has nothing to do with feelings, but addresses the question of thinking at the only point where it matters, namely as the thinking of the individual. We might say that there are historical situations in which the interest of the totality, in other words, the objectivity of spirit, can only be found in individuals, namely those who consciously and by design offer resistance to the trend. In contrast, what can be called the semblance of objectivity, the general consensus, is so much the mere reflex of social mechanisms that it actually lacks the objectivity commonly ascribed to it and is really no more than subjective illusion. I believe that, particularly in a situation like the present, we have to drive the dialectic forward to this conclusion. However, Hegel himself says at one point, if you think back to the passage I quoted, that when he looks at the law with subjective conviction, he justifiably regards its universality as the main enemy. This justifiably contains his whole position. Typically, for Hegel, he would not say that the individual's resistance, we would add the thinking individual's resistance, is purely a matter of chance. He would probably say that what the individual thinks is limited when compared to the objective process as a whole, because he does not properly realize how everything is interconnected. My own view is that this justifiably has to be taken much more seriously than even Hegel believes. It is characteristic of Hegel's thinking that he really want, wants to have it all ways, that he really wants to include everything, even things that simply cannot be reconciled. By this I mean that he adopts the standpoint of the universal. He tends always to claim, ideologically and in a conformist spirit, that the universal is in the right. But equally, almost as an afterthought, he would also like to be credited with wanting fair play for the individual. And he does this with a throwaway remark, in this case the single adverb, justifiably, merely in order that the individual should get his just desserts, simply so that it does not look as if anyone is being left out. Incidentally, this comment applies with equal force to the entire Hegelian macrostructure, since the whole point of his philosophy is that it not only teaches absolute identity, but also believes that non-identity, in other words, the very thing that cannot be included in identity, should somehow be incorporated into the concept of identity in the course of its elaboration. In this way, he could almost be said to be protecting himself at his weakest and most elementary point. I shall return to this particular problem at a later date. At the moment, I just want to take an even closer look at this justifiably. Thus, it, thus if, as I have suggested to you, the individual conscience regards right, rational right, or as Hegel calls it, the actual world of right and the ethical as the enemy, then a philosophy that teaches the the positive doctrine of the reconciliation of the particular and the universal should focus on this question instead of skating over it. The idea of absolute reconciliation, the idea that spirit should always be at home with itself and should rediscover itself, as Hegel phrases it, and at the same time the emphatic admission 
that the individual mind is simply not at home with itself in its confrontation with objective institutions and the objective historical trend. There's a conflict here that he cannot simply ignore. The reason that he cannot ignore it is that this state of not being at home with itself is a kind of methesis, a kind of participation in the very rationality that is thought of as the achievement of the act of identification. It would be easier for an opponent of Hegel, it would be easier for Kant to react in this way, since Kant rigorously maintained a dualistic attitude towards empirical subjects, and hence would say, very well, individual conscience and the course of the world are absolutely incompatible. But then he would add, so much the worse for the course of the world. However, if, like Hegel, I say that the course of the world and individual conscience are each mediated by the other, and that therefore the individual consciousness must discover itself in the course of the world, while simultaneously teaching that rightly and justifiably it cannot discover itself in the universal, then in effect it reverts to dualism, to Kantian dualism, and even hypostasizes this as a kind of positivity. To cite the English proverb, he adds insult to injury. Thus, not only is an injustice done to the individual by both the course of the world and the institutions, but if the individual recognizes what is happening and protests, instead of joining in and identifying with the process, he finds himself derided as stupid, narrow-minded, sentimental, and God knows what else. People continue to wag their philosophical finger at him until he gives in. Anyone who, like Hegel, insists on mediation should refrain from introducing a charismos or chorismos, a separation at a crucial juncture. He should refrain from representing the charismos of reason and unreason, chance and necessity as a positive. The absolute is treated by Hegel and the entire philosophy of history that talks about the world spirit as spirit, as a spiritual principle. But if this concept of spirit is not to, to degenerate into something vacuous, it cannot be allowed to break every link with the living spirit, this spirit of individuals. For living individuals objectify and universalize themselves in it, while even Hegel, as my earlier quotation shows, demands that they should be at home with themselves. Hegel perceives the need for the separation and regards it as a dialectical necessity, which he ought to criticize or supersede, but instead he tends to trivialize it and treat it as mere accident, simply to counter the resistance and the rights of the critical mind. And the downgrading of this separation subspecie individuationis corresponds to the theodicy of separation subspecie eterni. That is to say, to the doctrine that, as the totality of life, the separation is the desired reconciliation. However, whenever we ask this reconciliation to deliver, to show what is reconciled and how, we are only given the, the assurance that this is not what was meant. Reconciliation was the totality, and if you expect more from it, if you would like to achieve it for your own consciousness, and not even for you as a person, then you are simply small-minded, a petty philosopher of reflection, who has not yet reached the pinnacle of absolute idealism. And this simply will not do. This kind of thinking sins against its own virtue, against the bourgeois virtue that one should pay the debts that one incurs, intellectual debts in this case, whereas Hegel tries to wriggle out of it at this crucial point. Incidentally, I do not believe that I need to explain to you just how much I admire Hegel's philosophy despite such faults, but you can see here how even such a mighty edifice as the Hegelian dialectic not only demeans itself, but is forced to demean itself before the course of the world to which it has been harnessed. Karl Krauss's verse, What has the world done to us, applies not just to us as individuals, to each of us, but it also applies to what we imagine has raised us above ourselves, namely our philosophy. Following this Hegelian argument, and having said to you that what you can find in Hegel is this suggestive power that everything has behind it, everything that exists, the entire force, I would even say, the entire machinery of history that everything has behind it, faced with all this, where can we obtain the courage as citizens to prevent us from knuckling under? Particularly if it is the case, as I explained to you in an earlier lecture, that this life reproduces itself not despite conflict, but because of it, I believe that the answer to this is that the critical lever, the intrinsic critical lever, is to be found in the category of objective possibility.
To a certain degree, we must concede that Hegel is in the right, even though I have been critical of specific arguments, of course, without wishing to trivialize them. In particular, he is right to assert that an abstract ideal that has nothing to do with the course of the world, that is to say, an ideal whose conditions of realization have no basis in the world as it is, is impotent and worthless. And you all know how an ideal of that sort has had such an extreme, and I may say extremely dubious influence on Hegel's socialist dis disciples. But what we can say is that universal reason, which Hegel insisted on in opposition to all particularity, did actually bring about the possibility of reproducing the lives of all mankind at a more adequate, more human level. This happened quite straightforwardly in the first instance, thanks to the growth in the forces of production, that is, by virtue of the increasing opportunities. These opportunities are so tangible and so concrete they, that they provide us with a legitimate platform from which to criticize the actual course of the world. This advance is evident not just in the context of a so-called welfare society, which after all is very limited numerically even now when compared to humanity as a whole, but on a global scale. I should add very speculatively and perhaps rashly that this possibility of making a leap forward, of doing things differently, always existed, even in periods when productivity was far less developed, an opportunity that was missed again and again. This is something I shall perhaps return to later on. The point I want to make here is that this entire view of history contains a string or a single strand, and this applies both to the Hegelian and the Marxian doctrine. Emancipation from this single stranded view will only come when we refuse to accept the dictum that it has only now become a real possibility. It is important to realize that in all probability, the opportunity we see today of a sensible organization of mankind was also possible in less complicated times, when there were far fewer people and social conditions were incomparably more modest. The assertion that it did not happen, that it was impossible, is one of the propositions that owes its plausibility to the fact that it was uttered by the victors, and so its importance should not be exaggerated. Hence, I would say that the critical yardstick that allows reason, and indeed compels and obliges reason, to oppose the superior strength of the course of the world is always the fact that in every situation there is a concrete possibility of doing things differently. This possibility is present and sufficiently developed and does not need to be inflated into an abstract utopia that can be instantly scotched by the automatic retort that it will not work. It will never work. What you can see here is one of the most disastrous consequences of an idealist theory of history. By identifying reality and spirit, you conflate possibility and reality. Not only is reality identified with spirit, but spirit mind is identified with reality. The tension between the two is eliminated, thus quashing the function of spirit as a critical authority. Thus, in idealist thought, with its emphasis on identity, the tendency is to equate reality and possibility, and to do away with possibility as the subjective element of tension that corresponds precisely on the subjective side to non-identical being on the objective one. It is this act of elision that makes it possible to denigrate possibility as such. Nowadays, when Hegel's philosophy has long since been forgotten, this tendency has been secularized, or as I would prefer to say, vulgarized. It has become common prejudice to claim that utopia is not permitted and that therefore it is not possible. It follows that the spell under which most people live is not the spell of the materialism that is said to be so awful. The real spell that has taken root in this kind of thinking is that of a vulgar idealism that has long since forgotten its own assumptions.